we go. We're on. Hi. Uh, so uh, this afternoon's panel discussion then is uh, about uh, the kind of bridging the gap. I think it's called bridging the gap between uh, business and technology. So uh, with us on the uh, panel then, we've got uh, Michael, uh, Rachel, Seb, Mash, and Goiko at the end there. So um, this is very much a, a kind of your chance to ask these, these people the, uh, the questions you've got. If you do have a question, uh, just kind of raise your hand. There's two people running around with microphones. So uh, just raise your hand. Someone will come to you with a microphone. And then when it's your go, just, just kind of speak. In. There's one already. <laughs> OK, so uh, maybe we can get a microphone to, to Rich there. Hi there. So um, because of the, the, the reason for this bridge between the business and, uh, and programmers, do you think that it was because uh, programmers isolated themselves from the business, or do you think it's because business isolated themselves from programmers? I think Goiko should answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's because business people don't know how to code and programmers end up studying how to kind of code and not be involved with the business. And then at some point after you finish university, you start working somewhere and you realize you have no idea what these people are doing. Um, so th there needs to be a way to share that knowledge. Uh, th there will always be, in any company, people who are better with coding uh, and people who are better with derivatives trading. There's, very rarely people who are good at both at the same time. And it's important to have at least this kind of conversational knowledge about this so we can talk about the stuff and, and um, as an organization improve. So it's, it's not the matter that somebody isolated themselves from one another. It's just that specialist knowledge isn't necessarily easy to communicate. No different than, I don't know, somebody trying to explain how to set up Oracle PLC called triggers to a React programmer. Uh, it's just a different kind of bridge. I have a, I have a thing to add there. Um, I, I think if, if there is a proportion of the blame uh, to be laid, I'm sure it's, it is kind of on both sides. Blame to the testers, Bla that's always yeah. exist. Uh, testers, yeah, that's testers. No, but but I, I think, uh, I don't know, how, uh, I feel that it, for developers, it's uh, easier to understand uh, the business at a higher level and to communicate the skills required on that, that front and the domain knowledge required is easier to gain than for a business. Uh, of course, even in the business, there's a lot of complicated matters, but I'm talking about more kind of general understanding of the domain uh, than for the business to understand how a programming language works. But I think we don't pay, uh, the onus is on us to actually, as developers, to to try to um, reach out more and try to understand. Uh, I think that's what Sandro's talk yesterday was as well. Try to understand the business more and try to see it as our problem and not just their problem. Can I add something as well? I uh, just wanted to say that we're not atypical this way. It's like practically every engineering discipline has people working in an organization that don't really know the details of the engineering work that's being done, that kind of thing. I think the one thing that makes us a little bit different is that quite often we are developing software in places like banks and insurance companies and stuff like that that have a main line of business that has nothing to do with software development, right? What I think is kind of interesting is to think about things like architecture or medicine where essentially, quite often for regulatory reasons, you can't be the head of a practice unless you're a doctor. You can't be the head of a practice unless you are the architect. So it's kind of like in those areas, it's like there's this sense that these things should be integrated enough that basically that knowledge of the technology or the, the domain should be part of the entire organization. So I, I feel like we don't, we're kind of missing that in a way, you know. And, and the language itself. So this, this panel discussion is called Bridging the Gap Between Business and Technology. Well, maybe following from Masha's thought, the language that you use, is that having an effect on this kind of divide? Yes. So a language is an expression of culture. And so if people are talking two different languages, they're living in two different cultures, it makes it really hard to communicate. Um, one of the, uh, something's not directly responding to you, but responding to the original question. It's not the round, I don't see there to be, being any particular blame to be ascribed, but what I have seen is that in, certainly in larger organizations, there seems to be a tendency to want to treat uh, the lower orders, you know, develops and testers as fungible assets that you can, or resources that you can just plug and play. You write code, well, you just go into this team. Well, 
doesn't work like that because, uh, I, I mean, I, I've even worked with technical architects who get down to really low level of detail in their, in their designs, but even then, the developer or tester who picks that up uh, needs to have some domain knowledge to be able to make any sense of it or to, make, uh, to, to fill in those gaps. So it's not, I don't think it's done consciously to try and separate things, but what we have to do is consciously work to ensure that, that collaboration, that communication, um, yeah, it works effectively. And of course, the, the, this whole panel discussion is based on the, the title of Goiko's first book, I think, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, Bridging the Gap. Okay. And if you haven't read that and book... I, stole, I probably stole it from somewhere else. Yeah, so. for sure. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a saying. <laughs> but, but in this space, your book is the one where, where this was, was first, I think, articulated in, you know, in public. Um, it's probably still available. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. This, it's got to, actually, I'm going to go slightly off tangent here because I picked this book up. Um, it was an XP day uh, maybe four, five, six years ago. And uh, Goiko wasn't at that XP day, but somebody obviously had a, a whole block of these books. And they put them in the center of the, there was a circle, and they put them in the center of the floor. And they said, help yourself to books. And so I went and helped myself to one of these books. And I eventually got home, put it on my bookshelf having read it, and immediately noticed something that, that, uh, that has remained with me ever since, which is that Goiko consciously, at least he claimed when I, when I asked him about it, he consciously got the text on it to run in the opposite direction from every other English language book. So that if you see it sitting there on the bookshelf, it just sticks out because it's wrong. It's not me, it's my graphics designer did it, but you know, that, that's, <laughs> I, I can always take the credit. Yeah. And Christmas is coming. <laughs> yeah, so it's a good present. <laughs> All right, uh, do we have another question here? With someone, with a mic someone with a microphone there? Yeah. The question, I've got, you know, the question I've got is how do you handle the case when the business aren't interested in the technology at all and they're only interested in the new shiny or um, when things are on fire? Sorry, what was, can you repeat the question? Well, the, the question was how do you handle it when the business is not interested in, in, in the technology except for, when, except for the new shiny thing they want or when things are on fire? So we're saying that they're kind of they're, they show little interest in the kind of business as usual, keeping them engaged during that period. Is that what we're saying? Uh, how how do you, I mean I can start answering. Sure. Uh, I I think uh, that in itself is quite quite a smell. It's like how do you handle the business want their business done? You know, it's like they want something done, but they they're not listening to what's the best way to do it. Uh, to me, it's just a uh, I don't know, it's a problem in communication, in trust. Uh, it, it all depends on, on that particular context. Or, but it, it seems like there is a, a breakdown, uh, a, a dysfunction, effectively. And it's not the, that the two need to be bridged, but it's like I think at a much deeper level, there needs to be certain kind of uh, culture of better communication or trust needs to be established, in my, my view. Uh, my perspective is that that's that's almost always the case. So, um, I've, I've, well, no, everything is dysfunctional. But <laughs> let's not get on to <laughs> politics, though. Um, so, but everywhere I've ever been, uh, when I go in and do training courses, there's always, oh, I'm not sure the product owner can come along to this, this class because he's really busy um, doing important stuff. He can't learn how to talk to his team. Uh, and, uh, and her team, you know, basically, the product owners come in all shapes and sizes. The point is that. If you don't have that collaboration, there are financial, um, there are financial issues that crop up. So the way that I try to address it with some of my clients is by asking to actually look at what the outcomes are. So uh, uh, how many defects, how much re rework is being done. And demonstrating that, that a lot of that is actually based upon <laughs> misunderstandings of the, the technical team. And at that point, as soon as they can see it reflected in their bottom line, in their bonuses and their ability to d deliver those new shiny things, they begin to see that actually a little bit of investment from them pays dividends. Because in general, people work, I mean, people uh, are personally motivated by things that are good for them. So you can, you can shout it till you're blue in the face that the product owner is, works for the team and needs to be there at these meetings. But until they realize or at least uh, can, can see that they will get some personal benefit from doing that, that it will reflect better on them and that they'll be able to achieve their goals more easily, you won't be able to change them. Can I just add something? So I think in those situations, it's very often the case. Well, so you kind of mentioned they don't have time. 
I think often when a company's grown very quickly, they don't have, they literally are under a lot of pressure. So often the key people who have the knowledge are just too thinly spread and things start to suffer. Uh, and maybe it takes a bit of pain before people start realizing it's important. Uh, but if you're not involved in designing something, then you won't get the thing that you want. And uh, if you don't have time to be involved, that doesn't make it any different. You still won't get the thing that you want. So it, it, it's quite important. I, I want to chip in with a dissenting opinion here. Um, as it stands, programmers are still very, very in demand in terms of the job market. Don't waste your life building another stupid website, connecting to another stupid database for somebody that doesn't understand it. Go and find somebody else to work for where, you know, people appreciate your skills. Yeah, I just add as well that <coughs> I there's such a big difference between companies that have technical founders and ones that don't. And it's... Um, it, it's like night and day. I mean, there are ways that basically companies with technical founders can be, become dysfunctional. You know, that's definitely true. But in terms of understanding across the organization, you know, uh, uh, it's quite often developers can do a lot to try to understand the business. Uh, there are real impediments to business understanding technology, you know, having to do with, like, you know, the educational background and stuff along those lines, too. So, you know, when there's less of a communications gap, it's way better, right? Yeah, fair enough, but uh, what, what I'm trying to say is some gaps shouldn't really be, you know, wasted. Some bridges we don't need to waste our time building in. Yeah. Change your organization. Uh, next question. This lady in the front has been asking. Uh, uh, like she's got, yes, yeah, we're there, there with the mic. Mainly for Goiko. Um, because he made a very good point about getting feedback just from seeing the users use the software. Um, but I've worked in a variety of situations and projects where it's difficult to, to actually get that, to sit with the user. Sometimes the users are distributed around like a website. Sometimes you just get managers saying, my users are too busy for you mm -hmm. to sit with them, that sort of thing. Do you have any strat strategies for a trying to get access to a user, and if not, are there, are there ways that you can at least So um, th th there's a couple of ways of addressing that problem, but I think the primary thing is something I mentioned in the presentation where the fact that it's difficult shouldn't disqualify it. Uh, usually organizations, like immediately when a metric is difficult, we, we, we just don't even try because, oh, it's difficult. And Yes, it's expensive. It's expensive to go and visit users. It's expensive to put in a tool that allows you to, I don't know, monitor user sessions. It's expensive to, see, you know, business users are busy. It's expensive to kind of do that. But it's a question of kind of positioning it in a perspective of reducing uncertainty about something really important. So if we are, you know, if we are using this to figure out uh, is this helping our business users make uh, you know, this amount of money more or save some time, then it's quite an important decision to make. And for that, they will find time, trust me. I mean, you go to a person whose life you're making easier with that software, they will find time for you. Um, usually it's the people in the middle of the organization where they think, oh, these people are too busy, we can't do that. I worked with one business analyst who was quite cheeky. We were trying to get access to a senior business stakeholder at the bank, and we were told by the people we were speaking to that, you know, he doesn't have time to talk to you. And she found his name in the kind of company directory, called him and said, look, we've been trying to kind of do this for you for the last month. It doesn't seem to be working. Can we come and kind of talk to you about it? He said, yeah, yeah, I've been trying to talk to you for the last month. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's usually kind of people in between that, you know, cause this problem. Uh, so. My suggestion would be to figure out how important is the decision you're trying to inform with this, and then try and see, you know, how, ca how much can we invest. And there's technical solutions now. If you have distributed users' websites, you can do screen shares, you can do recording. That, so it's, it's getting cheaper and cheaper, but it's still more expensive than, you know, ignoring it. Um, so th I think there's a whole discussion. We need to start changing the, um, oh, it's expensive to measure. Let's not do it from, you know, well, it's difficult, let's figure out, is it justified or not? Mm -hmm. So next question in the front here, please. Um, hi, um, oh, I'm the 
not sure. Hello. Um, I actually got a question about not bridging the gap between business and technology, but more of a gap between bridging the gap technology to technology. Um, we are a small insurance team, uh, well, small to medium, and uh, the way we structured IT was we have a new projects development team which works with product development and business and develops like ships new products, and then the maintenance team. And uh, at the moment it kind of works. We ship the product and we pass it over, like um, train them up and uh, they support this. But in the long run, um, do you think that can cause issues in terms of the maintenance team will just keep growing bigger and bigger and we'll just keep shipping half ready product and just pass it over and forget about it? So, any thoughts? <laughs> do, they, do the maintenance team write code? Uh, they they, yeah, awesome. they do. Um, but it's more of a um, uh, smaller features or smaller projects, um, more of a m maintaining the system and uh, um, making like minor adjustments and things like that. Okay. So. Who, who's got any thoughts on that? I could add some thoughts on that just because um, I've just come off a project where my, our code has been handed to, they're called the enhanced team rather than the maintenance team, uh, but this, <laughs> they are respon responsible for a, a bunch of different projects. Uh, and making sure that those are not broken and work. And the way that we've been handling it is, uh, so even though I've moved to another team, I, I've had some pairing sessions with people in the team to help them understand the existing code base. So just having an open channel of communication. Um, we use Slack, so we have, uh, you know, sort of team rooms where people can at each other. And so just even knowing who the right people are to ask can really help. So some practical things you could, might be able to do. I've got, I've got a bit to add to that, actually. Um, in, in fact, uh, in my uh, previous employer, we, were, we had this kind of team. And uh, the dysfunction there was that that team was somehow regarded as the low-skilled team, right? So the, the star team would build the features, and the low-skilled team would maintain. And I, I think that's where the dysfunction was. I don't see any particular problem with a particular team having the responsibility of like fielding a third level support, as we used to call it, and they can fix certain things. The problem is that it's, it's almost a, um, a hierarchy of, of teams that, you know, they're kind of almost like a second class. And they are working in the same code base in the same way. Uh, and the way they're treated, and also the, the, the criteria of what is a good uh, product being shipped from, from this particular, the star team as well. So I think the, I don't see a problem necessarily with, with that kind of organization. I think it's more about what is the, the intent and the purpose of them and wh how, what, what, is the, what are we measuring from, from each team's perspective and their, their skills as well. So it's, uh, I, I think it just needs to, to be clear to the, the, the feature development team that you know, there's a certain level of quality that needs to be met. Uh, and also from the other team as well that there is a certain level, to, level of quality that needs to be met. And both should be uh, um, kind of equipped in a way that they can do their job. Can we have this one back on? Thank you. So I just wanted to ask at the back of it. So do you not think that at the end it will become that main, the um, maintaining team will grow bigger and bigger and will end up like being hundreds of people and then the development, uh, the new feature kind of team would be, I don't know, like 10 uh, in terms of this balance and uh, the code that constantly keeps being shipped and more and more people would need to be maintaining this? Well, that doesn't that depend on, again, economics, what you're trying to achieve? I, I, I worked with a company, this is going to sound completely crazy, but what they do is they sell to really, really big enterprise clients, and every sale they make, they fork the software off the main branch, they sell the clients this version of the code along with a maintenance team that gets chopped off the kind of these people, and they work for the client for about seven years, they run on seven-year cycles, after seven years, 
the client basically has to pay for migration if they want to keep using the software because they're, they're reintegrating <laughs> the main branch and they sell it like that up front. But what they've, ga what they've gained there is incredible flexibility for mm -hmm. the clients to add their own features. And after you know seven years or so, they'll say, well, these features kind of make sense to go into the main branch because all of these people are using it. So if you're trying to gain flexibility in your kind of front work and delivery for the clients or, or maintenance in this case, you know, may, maybe it's okay for the maintenance team to be 100 people and to have one team building stuff. I, I mean, the, the, the current gospel in the software industry is that people who build software should operate it and maintain it and then feel the pain to get, but that's optimizing for kind of operations and, and reducing operational burden or re reducing operational costs. Maybe the commercial model you're chasing is actually, well, we sell operations, so we want to, you know, we want to have a lot of operational costs because that's how we're making money. Uh, and that's what these mm -hmm. people did. So it really depends on the commercial model, I think. Yeah, I, I think Sorry. if you're actively developing a product and you're adding more features to it on a regular basis, then you should, you, this team that's adding the features should be responsible for the maintenance. It's that sometimes a, a product will go into a sort of phase where it's less actively being worked on, and then it makes sense to kind of clump a bunch of those products together and kind of say, well, these are more in maintenance mode. But I think to totally divorce any maintenance uh, from you know, the people who are actively developing the features, they are missing out on the pain that they're causing. So it's important. Yeah, there's, a, there's a feedback loop that basically just gets severed when yeah. you do that. It's yeah. a shame. Is there Rachel, I know you've been doing this. Do you have, it seems that, that you're kind of almost building this thing with two customers, right? Um, we struggle building for one customer, but now yeah. you're building for, you've got two customers, the actual customer and the maintenance team as a customer. Is there any problems there? Well, I think you should build, I mean, like, so I, I, I think if you're building for you to maintain it, uh, then hopefully you're kind of making sure there's tests and it's well documented and that kind of thing. And so then that means that somebody else could maintain it. Uh, I think there's a standard to be kept for all of the, the software that you develop that you try to do the best job you can of, you know, considering that other people will look at that code and have to work out what it does. People join the company and leave the company. They need to be able to figure out how it works. So I, I think it's quite important that that's just mm -hmm. the standard that you do for everything. Okay. The, who's got a microphone here? Anyone? I, uh, I was dying to suggest that maybe uh, a team swap could help at times uh, because then uh, everybody would get to see uh, both sides from uh, maintenance as well. So that said, I will now ask my question. <laughs> so, <coughs> excuse me. You just wanted to join the panel. <laughs> uh, so, so it's been. Uh, a long time thing for, for me, and, and I wonder as, as techs that we should be more uh, proactive because it, for years and years now, it, uh, it seems that, that we've been claiming sort of uh, craftsmanship and uh, all these type of things. And then I wonder if through your experience you've seen any tips and techniques to uh, bridge the gap. Because, <clears throat> for example, uh, because we choose to come to places like this that are self-selecting, uh, should we be more uh, proactive to get involved with a particular uh, business's uh, community uh, and be more uh, proactive? So, so we're saying, should, should the the software craftsmanship community try and engage more with the kind of similar communities within within business, I think. Yes. <laughs> Next <Okay>. question. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that really was it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, uh, as, as a lot of you are consultants, you must have encountered or heard of situations where uh, companies management brings in a consultant uh, that consultant recommends certain changes very quickly without having as much domain knowledge as people, as engineers who work in the company. And the management oftentimes takes it as gospel. 
instead of discussion. Uh, are there any recommendations in dealing with such situations? Don't employ those consultants. Um, so uh, there, are, there are good software engineers and bad software engineers. There are, there are people that can manage a team and there are people that can make a team explode. There are consultants that will come in and listen to p people. And actually, I think probably g generally the best consultants, they don't come in with an agenda. They come in to listen to the people that are, that are in the organization and then reflect that through their own lens of experience. Mm -hmm. So anyone who comes in and within two hours is telling your CEO to fire these people and restructure the organization <laughs> like this is someone that shouldn't have ever gotten the door. If your question is, how can you as a developer or a technical member of the team stop your CEO from listening to them? I, I don't <laughs> take up golf or something. <laughs> Actually, I meant... Wouldn't you I'm normally structure it as a pilot? So you kind of like, okay, we hear your recommendations, we'll try it on a small thing. I mean, would you not normally take an experimental so approach? I, I'm not actually blaming a consultant. I, I, yeah. I have more of an issue with the management who takes it as a gospel. How do you communicate to the management and to the business side that it's, it might be a very good expert opinion, but that's all it is at the moment until it's the product. Set up a feedback, yeah. up a feedback loop. Figure out what the, what the outcome is set up a feedback loop and measure it. Yeah. Come up with the data. Also, I think, uh, sorry, also I, I think it's important to um, build your own consulting skills so you can counter them in the sense that if you are there in the room or if you are part of the discussions, then you should be able to put those questions forward and those reservations for, forward in a way that they have to be answered rather than dismissed. Um, so you know. like there's a breakdown of trust already in a relationship that you have with management if they're going to basically just completely ignore you and go with the consultant's recommendation, right? So there's that thing, like you know, Mash was saying, of going and having consulting skills internally yourselves. Um, I think another aspect of this that needs to be said is that you know, sometimes you'll have people come in who basically have, you know, say, oh, you should be doing this instead of doing that. I, I agree we should all listen, but there's also this thing that People coming in from the outside can quite often see things that people embedded in a context can't necessarily see. Um, so I, I think in good consulting, you're highlighting issues rather than basically going and saying to people, you should do this. Mm -hmm. You're saying, oh, have you thought about this? Because if you haven't, there's something here, you know. Thank you. Who's, who's got the microphone next? Can we, can we get a microphone at the, at the front? Oh. Someone at the back, I think. Hello? Okay, cool. Um, so my question to the panel is, um, you know, when, when we have this conversation, uh, the, the gap between business and technology, we talk about the gap, and it's this amorphous concept. But in reality, it seems that everyone always associates the gap to a, a breakdown in communication. But is that really the case? Is that what a bad gap is? Is a lack of communication, or is it something more? Um, because it seems to me that we're trying to narrow the gap, but at what point does it become too narrow and become micromanagement? Or at what point does it become so narrow that there's no longer a purpose for having business and technology? Why not just be the same thing? So my question to the panel, very open-ended, is what is a bad gap? And what does it mean to have a gap? And you can't solve a problem until you know what it is in the first place. So, yeah, what's the gap? Didn't you, Rachel, have some experience with an organization where business and technology were pretty much merged? So, unruly? Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. We, well, so I have, a, I have an experience of an uh, organization where there hasn't been a gap. I think yeah. the, the, the worry of the gap, just to, just to kind of not go down that route, but like yeah, the, the worry of having a gap is that basically you will be building software that doesn't solve the problems that your business needs to solve. And ultimately, that's a bad way to run a business and it's disappointing as a developer to build stuff and then find it's the wrong stuff. So you need to build, bring business and developers more closely together so that there is this proper feedback cycle between the two. So then you build some stuff, is this solving the right problem? Build some stuff, is this solving the right problem? And the closer that you can bring these groups to work in tandem so that the developers understand what business they're working in and the business people don't feel afraid to ask questions about the technology that they're getting. That's the ideal. Uh, and, and I think, obviously, there are businesses that don't have large software components. And I think that's where it becomes very tricky, because they're used to running their other business departments in a different way than how software developers are used to working. So I don't know, that's a bit of a ramble. <laughs> 
Anyone else want to come in on that? Um, I can, I, I think, w well, one question was, what kind of gap is a good gap and what's a bad gap? Um, my answer to that is that uh, if you think of a team, a team has many different skills. Uh, and usually you kind of compose the team uh, based on the people that need to have frequent contact with each other. So I think if you look at it from that point of view, you can start understanding what are the parts of the business uh, or part, how do you compose that team, whether be it someone who is a business representative, a product owner, a user, or whoever else. And it's about how you compose a team. And I think it's then when you are composing a team, you're not thinking about management, but you're thinking about cooperation. So what you're actually trying to understand is what's the best way to compose this team to achieve a goal, right? So I don't think it's much about gap. It's about understanding the different skills and people you need uh, to come together to achieve that goal. So since Rachel wasn't taking the bait, can I just sort of like go? <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's kind of funny because there are some organizations I've come in contact with where basically you have developers making business decisions, right? Where actually they are basically going through the cycle and doing analytical work, you know, checking to see whether this is going to work with the market as well as going into development stuff itself. And, you know, it doesn't even necessarily have to be that way, but I think if you have teams where basically you are, you merge the role so highly that it's just like, okay, we just have a business goal and it's really like, you know, uh, you know, how much revenue should be coming in from this particular unit. Um, you can try to go and like evaporate a gap in some domains, and that's really kind of nice when you're able to. Definitely not something that every organization can do, but it's a pretty cool thing to go and like live without a gap if you can. Yeah. And, and it's, it's really great when you are working as a cross-functional team. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, the last team I was working on, we uh, were building something for the marketing team. So we had people from the marketing team working directly with us, and that was meant we could show them what we were building, and they could say, no, I don't want to do that, I want to do this. And that's a very quick turnaround. But it, it's, it's uh, not going to work for every kind of problem, I think. And yeah, as I've heard some people, teams in Amazon work with the P&L, right? Yeah. Profit and loss for yeah. that particular sub-piece of the organization, and they're highly integrated internally. Who's next? There was one down the front here somewhere. <laughs> Am I next? <laughs> so, um, to what degree does team size and team topology affect, um, you know, the communication gap between business and IT? About 90 degrees, that's when it really starts <laughs> falling off. <laughs> 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 when, when is a team too big or, or too small and when is the topology like the main thing that's standing in the way of, of communication Topo by topology I mean you know, distributed workers, satellite workers remote workers or co-located you know? I guess I, I, I don't know I'll, I'll, I've already started taking the bite so um, th 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 there's uh, you know, a ton of research that talks about um, people being able to coordinate with something up to, I don't know, 16 to 20 people. There's um, uh, rowing teams uh, typically used as an example and, and things like that. Amazon has this kind of two pizza team thing where if you grow more than two pizzas for dinner, like very large pizzas, you have to start splitting the team. And my, my Unscientific experience is kind of consistent with that. Up until 15-ish, maybe 20 people, you can have a good communication with everybody. After that, it becomes difficult to, to keep track of what's going on. And maybe that's where, I, I don't know, uh, I guess I'm, I'm hoping you're going to take a bite with the... the I, I will take a bite. Okay, okay. Right, so I would say <laughs> the, the fewer that you can get away with, basically. So, I mean, yeah. I think if you have two developers or three developers, there's going to be really good communication. And, but then you need to be working with people in the business for that to work. As soon as you get like five to eight people, you know, I think two pizza team, I'm always thinking like maybe one pizza team. <laughs> um, uh, because uh, uh, two pizza team, it, it's enough for people to not know what's going on and people to be working on things in parallel and for there to be a sort of loss of focus. So I would go with small teams. Yeah, I'm going to mention this in my talk later today, though. But there's like some research that came out back in April, and it was like going and doing 
analysis across thousands of GitHub repositories and sort of noticing that there's like an 80-20 rule for contribution on open source projects, uh, such that most of the 80% of the contributions are made by 20% of the developers. And it's not just commits, but also a conversation around the code. And um, the highest quality work basically comes from the people who commit the most or contribute the most. So, you know, I really feel that with that, high quality, you know, fewer bugs and everything like that, that really if we, the smaller teams that we can have, we get a great deal of conceptual cohesion for what we do. It's probably the more natural way for us to work is have only a couple people working on something. Then the question becomes how do we modularize our systems in such a way that we can have that, those tight capsules of, of work. And I think most of everything that we're doing in process and team topology these days is about how do we actually manage communication across these groupings or perhaps agree that smaller groupings are better. I don't know. So, yeah. I think we have another, another question at the front here. Yeah, so uh, I have a question about building these bridges um, between uh, business and, uh, and development, but the, the opposite way, meaning is, are there any like drawbacks of building two wide bridges, meaning that discouraging maybe in the business people to make any decisions because we are providing A-B tests, we are providing feature toggles, we are basically discouraging business people to make some decisions and maybe users also are kind of confused because we are measuring everything and automating everything, getting feedback loops. Should we get some balance in, in, in these bridges or this is just a one-way ticket? We should build as wide communication, as wide as it is possible. So you're saying are there some things that the business shouldn't have, maybe, a, maybe. have a part in? Yeah. Is that what we're saying? What do we think? I think um, maybe the metaphor is not taken the right way yeah. because actually if the, uh, the idea is that if the business and the development are closely cooperating with each other, that there is a agreed vision uh, and it's not about stopping them from doing certain things, it's about agreeing together that this is the way we need to go. Um, so, so you can achieve the same thing in either by just holding a, a wall uh, and you know saying this is our territory and you can't come come in here, or helping them understand what what the pros and cons and what the trade-offs are, and agreeing together which way to go, so that you don't have uh, lots of opinions in your in your product. So I, I I was really hoping that this this panel would go down the what kind of bridges route, and mm -hmm. this sounds like you know that. Sometimes there may be a case where people are arguing for like the drawbridge, you know, where you draw up the drawbridge and you put down the portcullis, you say, right, you told us the requirements and now we, we'll work on those technical problems on our own. The, the risk is that the more you separate, the, the, the more you may not benefit from uh, actually meeting your market and kind of building the right thing in the first place. I, I think you have to have two-way, as open as you can, <coughs> communication. I think we're in danger of uh, getting lost in the metaphor, right? So, because it's, it's not really a bridge, and there isn't really a gap. And uh, what we're trying to get past is uh, sort of feedback, the misunderstandings and miscommunications, the frustration that you have from doing work that nobody values because it's not what they were actually asking for. So, uh, we, you, can, you can do things badly in all sorts of different ways. So, yeah, your business can come and ask you for 27 different flavors of this feature and they want you to try and gather stats about how the users respond to it. Uh, at which point maybe you speak with them and you speak with the marketing department and you find out, well, what, what have you done bef beforehand to speak to the customers, to ask what features they're actually wa wanting, well, you know, what's the business plan, what, what are we trying to monetize? There's, there are lots of, I mean, your problem seems to be rooted in other systemic problems in your business. and so. I'd like us to track back and go, there is no bridge, there is no gap. It's about trying to improve uh, a team, a group of people uh, working together so that they can communicate on, on a level at which they understand each other. And when they're not sure that they understand each other, they can respond to whatever they've heard and said, is this, what, is, is this really what you said? Uh, so obviously, um, we, uh, a number of us up here have worked with examples, you know, giving the business concrete examples of what you think they've asked for and having them verify that, yeah, you really understood what you've asked. 
sorry, this morning interrupt you. Um, I, I think, um, you know, t taking metaphors as, you know, we, we, can, we can talk about what kind of bridges and stif stuff like that all, all the time, but I, I, w the one that, you know, really stands out for me, and I think anybody who's not seen this talk should go and, and down, you know, watch it on, on, I think it's on InfoQ and probably on YouTube. Martin Fowler and Dan North did this talk together at, in at QCon in London, I don't know, 12 years ago, 13 years ago, something like that. And it's called something like the crevasse of doom, or, or <laughs> you know, the, the Dan <laughs> North likes these uh, you know poetic titles. But they were talking about essentially how lots of organizations have these two islands where there's there's a, a ferry that you know occasionally carries information from one to another. And I think the um, metaphor of the bridge is basically rather than having somebody to you know carry messages around you just open a direct channel of communication you build a bridge so that when people want to talk to, to each other they can talk to each other without intermediaries I think at least you know um, my my early work in 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 that area was all about figuring out how do we not necessarily eliminate the intermediaries as in get them fired, but how do we open more direct channels where we get faster feedback, we get fewer of these translation errors and fewer of misinterpretations because the more you have to capture and translate and, and document and, and move you know, from one piece of uh, mindset to another, the more there's a potential for this thing to be misinterpreted and misunderstood. And for me, this kind of bridge is really about more direct communication and, and, and b better, more bandwidth. Because even if you have the smartest business analyst in the world that can capture stuff perfectly, document it perfectly, communicate to both groups perfectly, then you know, the, the whole department of, I don't know, 20, 30 developers and 20, 30 business people is communicating with the capacity of one person writing it down. And that's really, really slow. And I think kind of the market pressures today are such that you cannot afford to work that slow. So that, that's kind of, I guess, the idea with the bridge metaphor for me is how do we get people to just directly communicate and have a higher bandwidth of, of exchanging information across different roles. Okay, we have another question? Yes, oh, he's around there. Um, so I've seen a situation where an entire team of end users has completely lost respect for an app development team due to a series of unfortunate releases, not from getting the incorrect requirements down, but due to the introduction of, say, different bugs. Um, if you're in that situation where your entire team of users has completely lost trust in the app development team, how would you even begin to try and restore that relationship and, I guess, rebuild that bridge which is basically on fire? How do we rebuild a flaming bridge? <laughs> oh, God. So, I mean, that, you've taken the metaphor to a completely different <laughs> level. <laughs> uh, so, um, th that's, that's about building trust. And building trust, what you have to do is you have to speak to the users, find out what, needs, what they most need, and then deliver on that. Uh, the only way you build trust with anybody is by making, uh, by delivering what you say you're going to deliver. Um, and you need to do that in small bits, so, and you need to be accurate about it. So um, it's a shame that it got so far that you had a series of unfortunate releases, because, because I, I guess that indicates there's some malfunctioning in the feedback loop in the sense that there was an unfortunate release and you, you weren't able to rectify it. Um, your particular technical uh, problems, I have no idea what, what's going on there, but you need, to, you need to start fixing the problems and giving them what they want. I mean, can you roll back to when it was good, and then start adding the features again. The, there are many possible ways of going about it, but you need to give them uh, confidence that you can deliver on your promises. I, I would be tempted in that situation to at least introduce some new people at, on either side, on mm -hmm. both sides probably, because uh, it seems like that's quite a bad situation to have happened, and perhaps you may need different skills in the team, and. Potentially, it would help the business people to feel more confident that you, they, you'd heard them because you'd had some sort of reshuffle and brought some different people in. So, I mean, I think that might help, even, even if the people themselves were not to blame. Yeah, not to, aside from just the political aspect yeah. of it, it's just having people that don't have memory of the bad event. It can be very yes. powerful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
I can give you one idea that is completely technically within your sphere of con control. Kind of pol political stuff or, or hiring stuff might not be. And depending on how complicated your product is, this might make no sense at all or it might make perfect sense. So um, Marty Kagan in, in his book, Inspire, that's kind of a wonderful product management book, talks about something he calls gentle deployments where you run multiple versions of your app at the same time and you let users choose whether they want to use the new version and kind of fall back to the old version. And now there's lots of technical complexity in, in getting that running. That you have to multi-version data, you have to you know, operate different endpoints and things like that, but those are all technical problems you can technically solve. So um, at that point you can start rebuilding trust by basically saying, look, we have a new version. If you don't want to use it, just, you know, like the old version is still there. But if this new version brings you specifically some benefits, then hop on to the new version. Um, and then you can gradually get people to, you know, see more and more benefits in, in what you're releasing. And if nobody wants to use your new version, it's probably that you've not released anything important. Um, and, and kind of, so th th again, Technically, it might be completely impossible to do, or it might be relatively easy to do, or anything in between. But that's something that is a technical challenge, not not a kind of business or a hiring challenge. Cool. And um, a series of unfortunate releases sounds like a great title for I a just talk. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> great. Uh, I'm afraid this is going to be the last question. So, uh, who's got that? There we are. Uh, it's less of a question and more of a, can you share some success stories where. Uh, collaboration between yourselves and the business went really well that you brought lessons with you to future projects. Okay, so what's, what's been good? What's worked particularly well? Maybe some of the things that we can do at the start of a, of a new project to make sure that we're set up and going in the right way. So, um, well, I'll just stick, I'll, I'm, I'm going to stick with the question rather than the steer, sure. I'm afraid. Yeah. So I, I had some, a really good project with uh, an insurance company who um, a number of years ago, the UK changed its law about gender discrimination in insurance, and they knew that the market was going to be in flux for a number of months after that law became uh, hit the statute books. Uh, and so they wanted to be able to change their rates quickly. And their current turnaround time when I started working them was somewhere around two to three weeks of getting the new rates in and then having all the actuaries check in. Uh, and just bringing the actuaries in to the team to talk to them about what it is that they were doing um, led us to create, we actually used the spreadsheet that the actuaries used anyway as a source of data. Um, uh, and we discussed what the domain was, we discussed what they wanted to do, uh, we began to understand a lot of the complexities of the actuarial system uh, that were pertinent. And uh, by the end of, I think it took us three weeks, uh, we had, a, we had the, uh, they could change the rates and have confidence that they, they'd been changed correctly in 25 minutes. And so, that was, that was a huge success story, and it was by bringing people together. I can give you one story where um, I um, got invited to help uh, this um, organization figure out whether the developers are scamming them or not. It's, you know, really <laughs> weird. So they had this initial contract that was, I think, for a couple of million quid to build a uh, analytics system for affiliate advertising. And then uh, after the first version was done, uh, they wanted to have uh, a new version uh, that had real-time reports in it. Um, and the development organization was an external group and they quoted them something like one and a half million to do it. And the business people, the, the kind of advertising agency basically kind of was, well, you know, we paid two million for this, now we just want real-time reports. They, they, they're trying to, you know, uh, scam us because they, 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 they know we can pay them, so they're trying to extract money. So they, they were in a violent disagreement and they hired me. I was friends with somebody from the business side to actually see, is this justified? They, they were gonna pay the money, but just, is it justified? And I went to talk to developers. So this was before Kafka, before Coherence and, and you know, so they, they, if you wanted to have global real-time reports, what they had to do is build the data grid, have uh, you know, queue distributions, uh, like move away from a relational database totally, so re rewrite like the back-end, rewrite messaging distributions, have well, so kind of, yes, this is going to cost this much, this is going to go that much. And we, we brought everybody in the room, and, and I tried to kind of figure out, well, you know, maybe 
instead of committing to a million and a half, may, can, can we do something smaller and incremental? Can we maybe, rather than delivering a part of a solution, can we solve a smaller problem? And we try to define what the problem is. Why do these people need real-time reports? And, um, th and that's kind of, I think, a really great example of how this kind of communication thing just breaks down when you have too many intermediaries. So um, the, the person who suggested that started explaining that most of their competition basically distributes affiliate reports once a month, which means that people putting banners up on the websites are then, you know, once a month getting what worked, what didn't work, so they can adjust their ads. They are going to be better than the competition by offering real-time reports so that they, their collaborators, their websites can iterate on those banners faster and react on, on stuff faster. He said, okay, so the problem is faster. It's, it's not real time, the problem is faster, so maybe, you know, instead of throwing away Oracle, throwing away all the cues and, you know, rewriting our own, you know, Kafka didn't, we couldn't say writing on Kafka because it didn't exist back then, but, you know, stuff, can we maybe get it faster, not like total real time? So how about if we do it, I don't know, once a week? No, kind of once a week is pointless. So how about once a day? And then the business guy said, yeah, real time. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I want. And we realized that kind of all they, these people needed to do is, you know, change the cron job from running once a month to run <laughs> once a day. Easiest one and a half million they ever got. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, that, that, so, so that, that there's, there's a lot of it where, you know, when people hear different words like real time for developers means... <laughs> You know, if you're in aerospace, it means you can't even use Windows or Linux. You have to use QNX or something like that, where for these people it meant kind of sub 10 millisecond or something like that, where, you know, people don't create ads every 10 milliseconds. You can't, eat a, you need a designer, you need somebody physically to do that. And it's, it's just kind of this whole translation layer in between got in the way. Putting people in the same room allowed us, you know, to just change a config file. Good. <laughs> okay, I'm afraid we've got to, to, to bring it to a close there. Thank you for some, some really, uh, really interesting questions and uh, a round of applause for the panel, please.